This lesson is going to cover the art of the Americas after the year 1300. When the first European explorers arrived around the year 1500, the Western Hemisphere was already populated with a rich array of cultures and traditions. And what we'll do this week is look at mm, as much as we can of that rich tradition and the rich variety of traditions. You know, we could really spend an entire semester on just this topic. So we'll do our best to touch on the highlights, and I hope that it will pique your curiosity to do a little bit more research. Let's look at this dignified gentleman here in the photo. He comes from the Pacific Northwest Native American tradition. And you see here, he has on a cap of the U.S. Cavalry or the Army of some kind, and he's wrapped in a traditional blanket with the designs of his people on the blanket. However, when I look closely, my hunch is that the materials that were used to weave this blanket uh, weren't traditional. Probably there's some cotton there and definitely some dyed wool. Traditionally, these blankets were woven of cedar bark and they would treat the cedar so that it was very soft on the inside and yet completely rainproof on the outside. So he's here to show how even with the influence of Europeans, the traditions, many of the traditions maintained their dignity and their culture. As we look at these different cultures, we'll have an opportunity to explore some of the spiritual traditions that inspired the people. In the Navajo tradition, there is a belief that weaving has gone on since time began. In fact, the universe itself is a weaving. Its fibers were spun by Spider Woman, and she in turn taught Changing Woman, who is a sort of a Mother Earth kind of a figure. Now, Changing Woman, being a practical person, taught the art of weaving to mortal women walking upon the earth. And thus it became the tradition of women to carry on the fine art of weaving. If you look at early Navajo weaving, the patterns are pretty simple, horizontal stripes. But over the last 100 or 150 years, the patterns have gotten quite a bit more complicated. Here we see a rug woven in the early part of this millennia, 2003, by the woman Julia Jumbo. She actually supported her family through the art of weaving. Here we're looking at natural colors of the wool. And this artist raised her sheep, sheared her sheep, combed and processed the wool, spun it into fiber, and completed the weaving. So she was an integral part of the process from beginning to end. This rug that we just looked at, it demonstrates how the artists and the native peoples were able to take the traditions, the long-standing tradition that go back since time began, and turn them into something new as the influences from people off of this hemisphere have had their effect. Now let's just pass through the map quickly because we've already looked at the map in the last lesson and I think most of you are familiar with this. Right in here is where we're going to have the Aztec Empire. And right in here is where the Pueblo peoples were active. But as we consider the entire map, it's really important to remember that the hundreds of different civilizations that lived on, in the Western Hemisphere really had such a variety of expressions of spiritual beliefs and of ways of interacting with the natural world. One of the things to be aware of in considering these traditions is to look at mm, preconceived notions or projections and stereotypes. One of the stereotypes that maybe is in some way true is that most of these traditions had a very close relationship with the natural world, uh, aware of the solstices, of the seasons in a very profound way, and also had a real reverence and um, a deep connection to the animal kingdom as well. We'll begin by looking at the Aztec people. Go ahead and read page 838 for an overview of some of the background and the history of the Aztecs. 
Basically, they were a relatively short-lived culture. They had been a nomadic people in northern Mexico in a place, living in a place called Aztlan, which is where the name Aztec comes from. According to their legend, they were traveling, they were nomadic, and they came upon Lake Texcoco. In the middle of the lake, uh, they observed an eagle on a prickly pear cactus that was growing out of a stone. And this eagle represented one of the gods, the gods of Huichapochle. And it told them, this omen told them that this is where they were to have their capital, their great city. So over the next 400 years, they did that. They developed a beautiful city in the middle of a lake. It was on an island. And through the years, that island expanded as they reclaimed land from the water. They built causeways to the mainland. And at the time of the Spaniards' arrival, they, uh, some of the Spanish soldiers thought they were seeing a dream, that this city was floating upon the water. However, they had a quick rise and a relatively quick demise. In the 15th century, the Aztecs began uh, aggressive expansion, conquering their neighbors, and they took tribute. So they were able to become, it was a very wealthy city at the time of the Spaniards' arrival. And this incited the greed of the Spaniards, and so led to the downfall of the Aztec people. Their spiritual system, their belief system, was rather sophisticated. It was a combination. It was pantheistic, which means that they believed in many gods. And it was a combination of Aztec gods and ancient deities. One interesting fact is that um, the city of Teotihuacan that we looked at in last week's lesson was considered sacred by the Aztecs. In fact, they believed that the gods had created the current era at Teotihuacan, at the Temple of the Sun there. They also believed that the continued survival, their continued existence of humankind depended upon human actions. And these actions included the ritual bloodletting and even human sacrifice to keep uh, the world in order, so to speak. Let's look at some of the specific artworks that were created by the Aztecs. Here we have a page from a codex that was created by a scribe. It was created for the Spaniards to explain the founding of Tenochtitlan, really the legend that I was just speaking to you about. We have the eagle in the middle, and then we have the symbolic waterways that actually bisected the island on which the city uh, lived, on which the city was built. At the very center of the city was the Great Pyramid, and let's look at a schematic of what that may have looked like. This is a reconstruction drawing of the Great Temple at Tenochtitlan. And here we have two little temples at the top. One of them is built dedicated to the sun god, and one of them to the rain god, or you could say to fire and water. And during the winter, what we have is the sun rises behind the rain god. And during the summer, the sun rises behind the temple of the sun god. And at the solstices, the sun rises directly in between. So this is part of how they marked the seasons and honored the natural world. Now you can see here there's a little red stain going down the stairs and that really represents the the bloodletting and the human sacrifice which is believed to be a part of their religion. But basically, here we have the temple that it was, it was at the very center of the city and really at the center of the spiritual life of the Aztec people. Here we have a sculpture to look at. And the value here is to see a little bit of the mythology of the people. This is the goddess Coatlacu, And uh, she gave birth to the sun god. Um, but right when he was in utero, before he was born, his half-sister and brother came to kill her because she, they were jealous of the new child. And so what happened was um, he came out fully formed and drove off his half-brother and his half-sister. The half-sister turned out to be the moon goddess. So anyway, his mother didn't survive the big fight at his birth, and she lost her head. So in this sculpture, we have a couple of serpents in place of her head. 
all in all, it's a little gruesome, I'd say, and it, even more so when you consider that it at one point stood eight feet six inches tall and was painted. Now, this gives you an idea of uh, the mythology and the rich, um, kind of gruesome tradition that went with the Aztec culture at least as we know it today. You know, so much of what we know comes from supposition and from the stories that we add. We will never know what it was like to live as an Aztec. And again, they were human beings, like all of us. And so they did have a kind of a scary tradition, as do many societies uh, around the world. And this is an example of that. The most famous work of art from the Aztec people is the calendar stone or the Aztec calendar. This is a very accurate calendar with two uh, different kinds of uh, ways, ways of accounting for time. There's the 365 days of our year as we know it, but then there's a 260 day ritual calendar also. And um, according to the Mayan belief system, the world was created in four stages, and the fifth stage forms our current era. I'd like you to read up on page 841 to get more information about the stone. It's really fascinating. One of the most uh, outstanding arts of the Aztec people was the feather work. Because this is so fragile, really we don't have a lot that has survived. But this particular headdress was believed to have been given by Montezuma to Cortez, and he sent it back home to the king in Spain. Let's consider this headdress for a moment. Okay, so see all those beautiful green feathers? Each of those feathers came from the Quetzal bird that had two of these long tail feathers. So the green feathers there represent the death of hundreds of birds, actually. And uh, they were gained by the Aztec people from people that they had conquered. It was part of the tribute that was given to the Aztecs. One of the high arts of the Aztec people was book making. The scribes who created the book actually had an esteemed place in society. So here we have a story of the world, the view of the world, I guess is what it's called. In the center, you have the god of fire of time and the calendar. And shooting out from him you have the four cardinal directions. I find this fascinating because throughout the world people honor the four directions and the center. So the Aztec people believed in basically five directions. You also have all these little dots that go around the edge of the design and these represent the 260 days of the, um, the sacred days in the calendar. So this could have been used for divination or um, simply as a symbolic representation of the worldview. Now one kind of interesting fact about the books of the Aztec people is that they were not bound in the traditional way that we think of with books. Instead they were folded much as a paper fan might be folded, so sort of accordion style. So you could open two pages or you could unfold the entire folded document and look at it all at once. Well, after the arrival of Cortes and the Spanish conquistadors, the Aztec people didn't fare very well. The Cortes gained alliances of other people in the area, and they attacked the Aztecs and overran them. In fact, the city of Mexico City is, belt, is built right upon Teochtitlan, and he built, Cortes built a cathedral right on the site of the Sacred Pyramid. So basically, his actions, um, they might have overrun the Aztec people. However, the tradition in some ways remains as we have the calendar and the artwork that endures. So I'm going to take a break here and move on to part two and then we'll talk about the Inca people and the tribes of the North American continent. Thanks for listening.